Thomas Jefferson said that everybody ought to have a right to feed themselves. And today, I think that is something that is being moved away from because family farmers brought America to the point it is, but now we're, we're, we're going to a corporate model in farming. I've been lacking the farming all my life. It means to me that uh, I like to see the things the way God put it here. There's a lot against a farmer when he wakes up in the morning. So yeah, you have to be a man of faith to do that. And that's all I have is the faith. So that's what I'm gonna use. I've lived here all my life on this piece of land right here. That's where I've always lived. Farmers are very independent and they are very optimistic. Regardless of the situation, most farmers think I'm gonna make it. And you gotta have that in you to farm because there's an inherent risk in doing it. We're in a situation today where we have less than 1% of the people in this country producing our food. And it's getting smaller every day. And so they don't have the voice. Used to. 50, 60 years ago, they had the voice. Not anymore. The voice of agriculture now is these big corporations, multinational corporations that spend millions on top of millions lobbying to keep the, the control. For generations, farm families have been the backbone of our nation. But now, something is changing in agriculture, and it's posing a real threat to the rural way of life. We may not see the change happening on the shelves at the supermarket. For example, think about chicken. It's cheap, nutritious, and it's a really successful business for some companies, like Tyson, Purdue, or Pilgrim's Pride. But many of the chicken farmers who raise birds for these companies are hanging on the edge of bankruptcy. To understand what's really happening in our farming communities, you have to do what we did, go talk to the farmers. We followed a trail of farmers' stories, from the American broiler belt to southern India, to understand what it's like to farm under contract. I'm Mitchell Crutchfield. I'm Karen Crutchfield. And this is our home. My mama was the youngest of 11 kids. She was a um, pioneer woman, is what I would call her. Very stout, very strong. She would go out and plow, move the hogs, do what she had to do. And uh, that was that, that's where my generation comes from. In uh, 1986, the Tyson advertised and at the time, I had three little small children. So me and my husband decided to build two chicken houses where I could stay home. So that's how we first got started in building the houses. We decided on from what they had showed us that that's what we wanted to do. They tell you that, you know, basically we're going to grow together. If we're profitable, y'all are profitable. It's a team, you know, it's, it's betrayed that way. And in our case, you know, there's no other integrators here. We solely built for Tyson. In the United States, 25,000 farmers produce 50 billion pounds of chicken each year. That's $30 billion worth of meat. Today, Americans eat three times more chicken than they did in the 1960s. One of the reasons that people are eating more chicken than pork or beef is because it has become cheaper over the past 50 years. People are buying more chicken and the market continues to grow. But less than 1% of the chicken in the United States comes from independent farms. 
while 97% is produced by farmers under contract with large companies. In economics, you need a balance of power, which means that two parties sit down to negotiate a cash deal or a, a contract. You need to have a balance of power to get fairness on both sides. Right. Yeah, that does not exist That's between not grower good. and integrator. My name is Paul Brown. We're on my farm in Lena, Mississippi. It's a approximately 200 acre farm. It's a four chicken house on the 200 acres. Yeah. The total time that I've raised chickens is probably 14 years. But with Tyson, it's probably nine years, nine and a half years. Prior to that, I was a builder contract builder, so I've always been one to rely on my own. So I've always believed the harder that you work, the more you should receive. So just one day thought, what, what could I do that I could do myself and control my own destiny? I thought it was the chicken business, but then I quickly learned that that's not at all how that goes. Contracts in general are not bad for farmers. A fair contract can mean financial stability and a reward for hard work. But an unfair contract can mean losing your farm. The thing that's hard to do is figure out whether the contract you're about to sign is fair or not. I was a federal agent for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Law Enforcement when I bought this place. We bought this place in 01. Um, we'd been looking for a farm. My granddad was a farmer. My dad was a farmer in his younger days. I guess it's in my blood. How many houses do you have? Two. Two houses. And they're 50 feet wide and 624 feet long. I start 90,000 chickens in a flock. How many flocks do you get per year? Uh, it averages about six, somewhere around there. They, they provide the chicks and the feed, mm -hmm. and we raise them, and they come and get them and process them. That's why they call us growers, mm -hmm. because we raise them. That's basically what we do. They have them for two days. The day they hatch them and bring them to me, the day they process them at, at the plant, I have them for six weeks. So who's putting all the work into it? In their contracts with poultry companies, Farmers are called independent growers. What happens to the chickens on the farmer's or contractor's farm is their responsibility, but a signed contract means little to no autonomy. A typical chicken contract states that the independent grower agrees to follow the company's written and verbal management recommendations, including, but not limited to, watering, feeding, brooding, sanitation, litter, vaccination, medication, house environment, lighting, pest control, and biosecurity. It's what we call a contract of adhesion. It's controlled by one party, and it's written to their benefit, kind of like an insurance contract. Dudley Butler is an attorney, and he served as the head of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's only agency dedicated to protecting livestock farmers. I had a saying that a handshake over the hood of a pickup truck between two farmers was far more binding than a 100-page contract. And that's the way it used to be. But these companies are not farmers. You know, they might call themselves farms, Sanderson Farms or whatever. They might call themselves farms. They're not farmers. They're not farmers. They're an industrial model that instead of buying steel, they got chicks and it just moves through the system to get to an end product. I think the first important thing to understand is that this is a business built around tight 
integration. But one of the biggest advances came from these poultry business people like John Tyson and others, a lot of others, who figured out that they could create a steady supply of chickens to sell on the market by tightly integrating the business. And that started really back in the early 1930s. Vertical integration is where they control everything, you know, from the farm level up to the final consumer, either through direct ownership or through contractual relationships. In the poultry industry, companies are called integrators. That's because they own or control all of the steps in the production process. Integrators supply contracted farmers with feed blended in the company mill and chicks incubated and hatched in a company hatchery. The company decides the broiler's breed and the mandatory medicines used to stimulate growth and prevent diseases. The chicks are brought to farms that meet integrator standards and are raised following their guidelines. Once the chickens reach the weight desired by the company, the birds are picked up and delivered to the company plant to be slaughtered, processed, and packaged for sale. The company owns everything except the farm. Everything in this business is built around own it and control it, except the farm. And that always struck me as really interesting. Why is that? Why would this one piece remain off the balance sheet. And I interviewed Don Tyson about this in 2008. And he said, you know, it's because we love the family farmer. We want to support independent farmers. And we wanted to leave that part to the entrepreneur. But I think that that really actually glosses over the reality of the situation. The farm itself is, is really the least profitable end of this business. So that's why they, at the end of the day, came down to this contract system because it allows them to control the farm without having to actually own it. You may call it yours. You may, you may cut the grass and, and you may make some decisions. In essence, it makes you feel as though it's, it's, it's you have control. But at the end of the day, you are bound to a contract. If, if you can't satisfy the contract, then all you've done is in vain because it's no longer yours. And um, I, I know some people out there may say, well, that's just the way life is. It's, it's more to it than that. I, I understand that people go to the bank and borrow money and buy a property and they call it home. And then they're, they're, they feel like they're bound to the job that pays the bills. Well, you know what? You can quit that job and get another job and pay your bills. But once you get into this industry and you have a million dollars invested in a chicken farm, there's not a lot of other things that you can use a chicken farm for other than to grow chickens. What I have out here cost a million dollars to build it today. And when I bought this place, I was relying on this as a real supplement to my retirement. That's why I did it. Or a big part of the reason I did it. But it's not. <laughs> Are there any new houses in the area? Is anybody recruiting or trying to get new farms? In oh, the yeah. They're constantly trying to get people to build new houses. And there's a few going up in West Virginia. I'm a little bit surprised at how many people are actually building houses. But like I said, they lie to them so much. Mike Weaver is the president of the Contract Poultry Growers Association of the Virginias. He took us to meet Eric Hedrick, who has one of the largest chicken farms in West Virginia. I asked Eric, why did you sign your contract? I was a boilermaker, uh, going down the road all the time, working in powerhouses. I'm a certified welder. I'm a, a licensed plumber in the state of West Virginia. Uh, you know, I can turn my hand about anything. But I was, home, I was going all the time. Uh, I have three daughters and a wife that I needed to be home. And, and I seen a uh, uh, real estate offer for this place being up for sale, 13 houses. I thought, finally, I will be home. I mean, I farmed all my life, but I said, finally, I'll be home for about five years, and it's great. It was fine. I mean, everything was working. And I sell, 
I used to sell 1.3 in 13 houses, 1.3 million pounds of chicken meat every 35 days. When you were signing up, mm -hmm. tell me some of the things that they were coming to you and saying. Oh, well, one of the biggest ones was if you, if you reasonably take care of your birds, you, you'll have no problem. This, this, will be, this will be great. Well, that's a joke. I, I mean, I could sit down, and, and my wife really could. She could sit down just right off the top of her head and write you a list of bills down here that takes a, the biggest part of your check and it wasn't on that daggone cash flow sheet that Pilgrim's Pride hands you. Before farmers sign a contract, they receive brochures and other materials from the companies that are supposed to give an accurate estimate of how much they can expect to make. What convinces many farmers to get into the business are verbal promises from company representatives who visit their farms, or their handwritten estimates like this one. The message most farmers get is this, if they work hard, they're going to make money. Well, my name is Clarence Leverett, and I was growing chickens from Marshall Durban, and it, it looked like it was a good business to get into it, and, but once I got into it, it was a big nightmare. So when you were looking into it, what did they tell you you were going to make? Sixteen to 21000 every every batch of chickens. That first batch, it was about $21,000 check. I said, boy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna enjoy this. <laughs> but the second batch might have jumped down to 19. Within a year's time, I was ready at about 12,000 a batch. So what, what, what went with all that other 21? About 12,000 a batch? And that's counting your expense out of it. They give you the $12,000. What you have left out of it, you can't even feed yourself. Farming in the South, it ain't no little man. It's only the big man. It costs around $1.2 million to build four chicken houses, which means most farmers have to get a loan. In all of agriculture, it's common for farmers to go into debt to run a farm. Many get loans to buy their seeds or equipment and expect to pay it back at the end of the season when they sell their product. But chicken farmers have to get loans that go out 15 or 20 years just to get into the business. For a loan that big, they often have to use their farms and homes as a guarantee for the bank. If they can't make their payments, the bank can foreclose on their property. Now, when we build these chicken houses, we, we take everything that we have or ever will have and put it on the dotted line. I mean, so we go out on the limb and the company has no risk whatsoever in this. And so how much time do you have left on your mortgage now? <laughs> <laughs> do you hear that? She said when we die. That's, that's about, I, I mean, they, they pushed us to the point that right now we, we're in the refinancing stage through a government guaranteed loan. Why? Because they will not pay you enough to pay your bills and raise their chicken. Debt in chicken farming is a serious problem. Almost 70% of chicken farmers were carrying debt in 2007 making them the most indebted of any farmers in agriculture. By 2011, contract chicken farmers collectively owed over $5.2 billion. Are there other uh, enterprises in farming that you can get that size of a loan for that easily? No. Absolutely not. No, we're close. Even for other livestock? Even further, I can't get close to that kind of loan in agriculture. We actually use taxpayer money to put farmers in this position. The federal government can give private banks a guarantee that up to 95% of the loan that they give to a farmer will be refunded to the bank from taxpayer dollars if the farmer can't pay it back. 
but in the chicken business, the result is that banks have almost no risk in making a loan. This might make them more willing to give farmers risky loans without requiring much commitment from the companies. From my personal experience, having covered this for years and interviewed farmers in this business throughout the United States, I can tell you, I would describe the typical poultry farmer as somebody who owes between $500,000 and $2 million on their farm. They live uh, flock to flock or paycheck to paycheck. For the people that rely entirely on this business for their income, I would say they live, uh, whether or not it's on the poverty line, they certainly are living on the edge of bankruptcy and they're living paycheck to paycheck in this business. Operating a business from paycheck to paycheck doesn't match up with the original promise of a secure income. Farmers take on long-term debts, but the companies only make short-term commitments in the contracts. They can change the agreements whenever they want. They can bring farmers fewer birds, skip a flock, or even cut off their contracts completely. With their contract, when we went into it, we were under the impression we had a five-year contract with them. And I did read the contract. In fact, I read it multiple times. <laughs> Even though I read that it said flock to flock, in my mind, because on the very front page it says I have a five-year contract, I am assuming that that means after my five years. Right. But it's not. It's from the very day you take on raising those birds for them. Mm -hmm. So essentially you have a five-year contract that guarantees you chickens from flock to flock. So here I am today, plugging along, trying to wow. keep it going until I can get rid of the mortgage and then, um, yeah. you know, I'll just have to play it by year from there. Most chicken farmers can't really predict how much their next paycheck will be. This is because chicken farmers are paid through a mechanism called tournament. They compete to produce the largest amount of chicken at the lowest cost to the company. Most farmers like having the idea of a system based on fair competition. But the tournament system is not a fair competition. It ensures one result. The company always wins, even if it's at the expense of farmers. It's kind of like throwing scraps out the back door to your dogs. You have so much on the plate, and there's nine dogs, and you scrape it off, and it's every man for himself, okay? And that, and that sounds fair, and it seems fair, because if you're quick enough, but there's the, the, the bad thing is, there's not enough on the plate for the nine dogs. So that's kind of what you learn if you are willing to, to ask the questions and, and understand this whole process and to look at the numbers as to what a farmer gets paid for the product that he produces, you will see why I use the, the analogy scraps because that's, what, that's, in comparison, that's exactly what it is that you're receiving is scraps. Consumers spend about $2 on a pound of chicken. On average, only five cents of that goes to the farmer who raised it, but they even have to compete for it. Here's how it works. Farmers who receive chicks during the same week compete against each other to produce the most chicken at the least cost for the company. After five to six weeks, the chickens are picked up by the company and weighed. Here's where the calculations begin. The companies factor how much it costs to provide chicks, feed, and medications to each of the farms. This determines the farmer's settlement cost, which is how much it costs the company for that farmer to produce a pound of chicken. Farmers are ranked based on their settlement cost, and the company calculates the average of all the farmer's settlement costs. The farmer producing at that average level receives the base pay. This is the price per pound of chicken the company promised in the contract. Farmers whose settlement cost is higher than average, for whatever reason, get paid less than the base pay, while farmers with a lower settlement cost get paid more than the base pay. Tournament payment helps control costs for the company, but makes paychecks unpredictable for the farmers. The important point to remember is that the tournament is a zero-sum game. The bonus for the top player is taken directly from the paycheck of the bottom player. 
So this systematically divides the farming community and makes farmers compete against each other for their paycheck. Only some of the chicken farmers benefit from the tournament system, and most of them need an extra source of income to sustain their families. Data from the USDA show that households with chicken farms in the top 20% have a total average income of $143,000 from all of their farming activities and jobs off the farm combined. At the same time, the bottom 20% earn an average of only $18,000. Looking at these numbers, it's hard to tell how much actually comes from raising chickens. Chicken companies have this information about their farmers, but it's not made publicly accessible. A study conducted directly involving growers in Alabama showed that regardless of income level, chicken farmers have had significant negative returns on their investment. You know, this clearly shows unfairness to me. I mean, minimum wage, no benefits. <laughs> not very good working conditions, and uh, they're losing money on average for their investment in all of their work. How many people that live in America dread going to the mailbox to get their check? If you're a chicken grower, this has happened numerous times, and it, and it all kind of boils down to opening that envelope. In the nine years we've been doing this, I've been paid as much as $30,000 for a flock of chickens and as little as $13,000 for a flock of chickens. So that's quite a stretch. And I need to earn a minimum of $21,000 per flock just to break even. My kids don't want anything to do with a farm. Why? Because you're poor. They take and drain every dime out of you and then expect you to sit there and take it. And then they turn around and force us to be paid under the tournament system based on their inputs, which we have no control over. If, I, if I'd have known 14 years ago what I know today, there's no way I would have bought a poultry farm. Mike keeps extensive records going back years. He can point out times when his checks drop by thousands because of getting diseased chicks. After a few years under contract, many farmers begin to question the tournament system. How is this an honest competition if their rank can be determined by problems with the company's inputs? The integrator's position is we want uniformity. We want uniform chick, uniform feed, uniform product. Yes, they do, but they don't accomplish that. Not all feeds the same, not all chicks are the same. Because of the tournament system, a farmer's paycheck depends on the quality of feed and chicks they get from the company. For example, farmers have to hope they don't get chicks from hens that are too old or too young. Chicks from these birds are usually weaker, and that would put a farmer at a disadvantage in the tournament from the start. In 2015, North Carolina farmer Craig Watts decided that he wanted the public to know what the inside of a chicken house looks like. He felt that many chicken companies were manipulating contract farmers and consumers. The industry will tell you that, um, that all chicks are created equal. There's a lot of things that happen before the farmer ever receives those chicks that determine how well he will do in that tournament. Wow. And that is not normal. I knew. One wheelbarrow load is not normal. No. That's coarse. That's not dead. That's just that's ones I've walked through and killed. And this is in it. You have done nothing different in this house. The only thing different is the chicks that they brought you in this batch. Right. And, but it goes back to I don't know tomorrow morning when I step in here what's going to be wrong and how much money it's going to cost me. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of things can happen. And um, like I said, I, I'll struggle and uh, probably take a hit in the performance. And imagine I'll take a hit financially. Competition is like if I draw a line here, and I draw another line here, you and I race from this line to this line, the winner is the winner. Whereas if you get bad chicks, you've backed up about 10 yards. It is not, uh, it is not competition. I think Bob Taylor put it best, it's a rig lottery. It's based on what you get, when you get it, and then how you manage it. The tournament system takes a farmer's hard work and turns it into a gamble. For many, it's a debt leveraged game some farmers do okay, 
but your success isn't entirely up to you. If the company gives you poor quality inputs, the deck is stacked against you from the start. Some farmers have questioned whether the companies could be sending them sick chicks or delayed feed on purpose. You know, at best, the feed and the chicks are randomly, they say it's randomly uh, assigned. assigned. As far as I know, no statistician has ever done a test of that. It's just a unproven assertion. The fear of retaliation is very real for many farmers. It discourages them from speaking out publicly or from banding together and standing up for each other. If I didn't get up at night and come check behind my truck that bought some feed down, I get stuck with some, uh, he might tell me he bought down five tons and then, and then leave me but with three. I get charged with the five, but the truck didn't dump out for three. That affects your pay, that, I mean, that affects everything about the farm, that affects your uh, performance. What eats away at people over the years is the inability to control their operation and the knowledge that so much of the, their success is out of their hands. That, coupled with these levels of debt that are hanging over their head constantly, creates this really, really toxic mix uh, of stress and dependence and, and powerlessness that just eats away at people. Raising chickens under contract is a risky business that requires major investment. Chicken farmers who take on that risk know it will be hard work but they expect to make money at least after they pay off their loans. But there is one clause in their contracts that can make it almost impossible to get out of debt. You can imagine what the update was like when we got it. The letter, the mandate letter. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like somebody walks in and says, hey, guess what? Somebody stole your retirement plan. You know, it worked. The Crutchfields, like many farmers in their area, found themselves in a financial crisis when Tyson told them to upgrade their houses with expensive computer systems. They received a letter with a clear mandate, make the investment or lose your contract. Today, the Crutchfields are trying to hold on to their home by being independent farmers and working three jobs. After 27 years under contract with Tyson, they're still in debt and there's a real chance that they might lose their family's farm. Our three old houses, we would have had to put as much money in back in them as we started with when we first started. That's, that's how much they wanted us to update. You know, we've, we've done the math on this deal, just a rough math. Here we're going to borrow 250 to $300,000 again at 60 year old. You do the math. I'll either be, if I'm lucky, I'll be 75 years old and I'm still paying, you know, on this deal that's supposed to pay off in 10 years, possibly 78 years old. Where, where is the light at the end of the tunnel? It was in the early to mid 1990s when the growers started being squeezed by the, the power of the integrator and growers were forced to make expensive upgrades in equipment. There is no negotiation over that, that you would have in a competitive market. So it's a very one-sided contract. So the, the integrator uses their power to force the grower to accept whatever contract terms they, want. they think is appropriate. Many chicken farmers wind up stuck on a treadmill of endless debt. They enter the business because they believe in the company's promise of a steady paycheck that will reward their hard work. First, many have to take out a loan, which is on average more than $1 million. They often put everything they have on the line, including their farm and home, 
but the unpredictable paychecks from the tournament system leave them insecure. The fear of being at the bottom of the tournament and the threat of losing their contract leave many farmers no option but to make expensive upgrades demanded by the companies, even if it means extending their debt long into the future. And so the cycle starts over. Mounting debt and the threat of bankruptcy are what really keep many contract farmers in this system. And what would you say to uh, a grower who was considering getting into the chicken business for the first time? Don't. But if you do, if you just think you've got to have some chicken houses, you better put it on land that's not sentimental. You better put it on land that you don't mind getting rid of. Are you financially prepared for that and are you emotionally prepared for that? That's what's got to be answered. I think the emotionally is probably worse than the financial. I mean, the company, they're trying to get you into their business. Okay, so they're going to make it sweet. Yeah. The problem is that once you get the deal worked out, the company can change the deal. They've lied before, they'll lie again. Who is stupid enough to take everything that you've ever worked for and lay on the table to get in bed with a company who has promised to pay you by the weight of their scales, by their math. If you're comfortable enough and have enough confidence in that company to get in bed with them and allow them to, to make those decisions for you, then you'll be as big a fool as I was. Do it. And... That's all, that's, that's basically it in a nutshell. The chicken business wasn't always like this. In the 1950s, before corporations took control of the industry, there were 1.6 million farms selling chickens across the United States. Vertical integration put all the profits and control into the hands of a few. Big integrators have driven most of the independent processors and feed mills out of business. That creates a glass ceiling for beginning farmers who want to grow their farm. Walker Sides manages Hickory Nut Gap Farm, a North Carolina farm that raises free-range chickens on pasture. The, right now we're doing about 10,000 birds, I think, per year. But you just don't get that much for chicken. You know, people are used to paying a dollar fifty a pound at the grocery store for a chicken breast. And our chicken breasts are nine dollars a pound. It's a lot more expensive for a small scale farm like Walker's to produce their chicken than it is for multinational companies that produce billions of pounds of chicken each year. Honestly, the most expensive part is processing. It's expensive. But really, if, if we could find a way to process all of these for cheaper, or had the time to process them, they'd be a lot more profitable. It'd be a no-brainer. But the fact that we have to pay for the processing, I mean, that's, that's really our biggest holdback on all animals. There's kind of this weird no-man's land between being small, where you're small enough that you're not using a lot of outside things, and so you can be pretty profitable. And then there's the big, where you're, like, using it. You're so big that things are cheaper, and then there's like this in between. <laughs> the lack of independent processing and infrastructure means that once you get into growing chickens under contract, it's very hard to get out of it. Janelle Pridgen's family farm was one of the top producers in their complex when Purdue suddenly decided to move production elsewhere and cut off her family's contract. They've struggled to pay down their debt and make it on their own. If somebody's getting out of contract chicken production, it's hard with boiler chickens because chicken meat is so cheap, so cheap. If you think you're gonna get out of contract chicken production and you're gonna pay off the loan that you had with your chicken houses and you're going to make it just growing chickens, you're not. You know, these companies tout this as a way to save the family farm, but really you, you've just become a, um, an employee a, a, or a serf on your own land is what you've become. 
because even though we didn't lose our farm, we came close. And for me, that that just that just says it all. It really does. But I cannot imagine somebody with a million or two million dollars worth of debt. There's no way to get out of it. No way to pay it off selling a piece of meat at a time. You just can't. And so basically, when Tyson cut the contract, you couldn't keep making the payments. No, you can't. There's no way. I'd and there was, there was no other integrator that would take us to be able to, to make our payments. There was you nowhere know, to go. And like I said, just, just nearly immediately, um, farm credit started coming in and doing replevin and foreclosure on us. And uh, our court date from the come and take everything was December 5th of 2012. And at 10.59, December the 4th, we filed for bankruptcy. Yeah. What did that mean to you all to have to file bankruptcy? It's the worst. Why is that hard for a farmer to have to file bankruptcy? It's failure. Um, to get out from under the debt, the only option I have is to sell. When I saw what I owed on the farm, I said, if I can get that, that, that'd be the greatest blessing in the world. So ultimately, it's, it's going to end the same. I'll sell for zero profit, or I'll go bankrupt for zero profit. Same thing. Well, maybe if I ask you a question as well, can I ask you what this was like? Uh, for you going through this and, and watching this happen? Heartbreaking. Truly. I've seen how bad it affected my husband emotionally. And uh, it was pretty rough. It is pretty rough. It's still hard. Because at the end of this, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, where we'll go. This is our home that he built. Our little girl was born and raised here, and uh, lately she's been asking questions such as what will happen to her bunnies, what will happen to our horses. Will we be able to take this table? Um, but ultimately, his happiness means more to me than anything on this farm. And uh, I've finally somewhat seen some peace in his heart and mind. And uh, that part is comforting, but uh, it's been rough. It's just, it's not good. Nothing about this has been good. These chicken companies make millions and millions of dollars off of us, and the banks, finance companies do as well. And uh, we're just here to fill their pockets, and when they don't have a need for us, we're done, and we're pretty much thrown out like the garbage. It's a nightmare type of business, really. Nightmare type of business, go. Because when you work all your life, when you work all your life for something, then somebody could come and take you with a pencil. It's kind of hard to peel the swallow. Well, well, my family, they took off and left me. They couldn't take it. But I just kept my head hung up. I said, when I'm dead and gone anyway, I'm not going to take it. Africa's gone. It's, it's pretty much gone. In this industry, many farmers face a shocking realization. 
Their success is out of their control, and the company's decisions could make them lose their farm. Some farmers turn to the courts for justice. My name is Alton Terry, and I was the um, president of our local uh, growers association for our complex uh, here in this part of Tennessee. We're geographically well, isolated. Alton Terry took Tyson Foods to court, claiming that the company had retaliated against him. He alleged that they had incorrectly weighed his birds, and when he complained about it, the company refused to bring him his next flock. He documented more than $30,000 in losses due to the company's actions. Alton documented several examples of mistreatment and sued Tyson for unfair and deceptive practices. He knew he could prove his allegations, but the judge dismissed his case altogether, simply because what he couldn't prove was how Tyson's retaliation against him had harmed overall competition in the industry. A lot of people ask the question, well, what does that mean? You know, you have to prove competitive injury. And I use the analogy, if we're living uh, in North Carolina, you and I are living in the same subdivision, and I get mad at you, and I go burn your house down. Okay, well, to prove if you were trying to base your claim on competitive injury, and you would have to prove that me burning your house down affected the price of every house, at least in the whole Southeast and maybe in the United States. You know, these companies have so much power, it's hard for one grower to stand up to them. Our federal judges will not stand up to billionaires cheating other people out of the value of their assets. They won't use the federal laws that are already there to protect the people. And to me, that was the most disheartening thing about uh, the whole system. Let me, let me just, I'll just be quite honest with you on this. Um, when I was going through my case, I, I knew that I may not win. And I'm a, one of these kind of people who really, uh, I don't know, I don't, I, I don't have late payments on I don't owe people things. I carry my own weight in society and all that. And one of the things that was a backstop, I thought, in my own mind, was that if it really came down to it and I couldn't get justice through the system, that I had a life insurance policy that would pay off all my debts and leave my family without having this type of debt. And, um, yeah, I did try to commit suicide. And when you get that situation, it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous situation to be in because the court is the last resort for normal folks. I mean, the court can be the last resort for rich folks too. But when you're, when you're, uh, David up against Goliath, the court is the only thing that can help you. There is one federal agency that is supposed to have the power to police big business in the livestock industry. That agency is called the Grain Inspection Packers and Stockyards Administration, or GIPSA. But for almost six years, the poultry companies have lobbied Congress to put a stop to any effort this agency made to enforce regulations protecting farmers. It is far more dangerous, far more dangerous, for corporations to control government than it is for government to control corporations. And the government should be doing their job to help people that can't protect themselves. We as poultry growers have nobody else to go to. And if we come to you and you don't do your job, where does that leave us? The contract poultry industry in the United States has proven to be incredibly profitable for big business. But to keep raking in the profits, companies are constantly seeking out new frontiers in the global marketplace. For a number of years, the, you know, many, many years, the per capita consumption of, of, uh, of chicken meat increased every single year. 
It's just unbelievable if you take if you take a look at it. But eventually, it becomes saturated. So that means that that the markets are not in the future are not going to be in the U.S. We're going to have to find a place where economic uh, development is such that they have an, enough money to buy protein. The question is, where is it? Where are these? Places where are the demand grow? Where's the demand growth going to occur? And it's not going to be in the U.S. Demand for poultry products is booming worldwide, particularly in India. As the industry expands there, companies in India are turning to the U.S. contract model as the best way to make a profit. Integration is almost there in now in India. Oh, around 80% is around in the integrators now, broiler integration. It has started in 2006. 2006, integration started in 2006. Yeah, yeah. And already it's at 80%. Yeah, yeah. I've heard uh, some estimated numbers that maybe 80% of the broiler industry is now under contract, so it's more the commercial production. Does that sound... Yeah, almost now in South India, we farm almost like 90% or 82, 90% is under integration or contract farming. Mm -hmm. We are now fourth largest chicken meat producer in the world. Mm -hmm. Our placements today on record is almost like every day, 9 million to 10 million broilers mm -hmm. in the country. That means a game of volume came into business. Mm -hmm. So earlier volume was not at all a consideration. Now, even if I want to survive, I need a bigger volume of production. So once the volume is huge, the cost reduces. Reduce. Uh -huh. That is where the integration started. The earlier, prior to the integration, it was all the small, small farmers were there. So then the margins were very high, so the, it was very viable business. When the market started coming down, that it becomes unviable to the small farmers. So this uh, integrators took over. So they started uh, making integrated area. They collect the farmers, they work, uh, have a contract, a standard uh, agreement. Then they start giving them the inputs. The industrialized and vertically integrated model of chicken farming that was developed in the U.S. has taken hold in India. For some farmers, this represents an opportunity to start a new business. But it also means that Indian farmers are starting to have some of the same problems as farmers in the U.S. Do you receive a copy of this contract? No, no, we can't read that. Uh, yeah, there will be 50 to 60 papers and we have to sign them. We can't, we have no rights to question them. The rights means we don't, if we, uh, we keep on stating that they don't give us. Uh-huh. Uh, but where is the copy of the contract yeah, actually? In the uh, company only. Man. We generally keep the copy and we don't have, we don't know what we have signed for that also. So they don't even give you a, no, no, a no, copy no, to no, take no, home? No, 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 uh, In your experience, when you were doing this study, did you find that not giving the farmers a copy of the contract was common practice amongst all the integrators? Yes, yes, 99%. Dr. Chidananda is the head of the Department of Animal Sciences at the University of Agricultural Sciences in Bangalore. He conducted a study of contract chicken farmers in Karnataka to find out if they actually benefited from their contracts. He found that while some farmers showed a small increase in income, the real profits went to the integrators. Suppose I take loan and start integration. Can I clear the loan? So no, sir. It's impossible. <laughs> yeah, it will be, be the... You got the point. You will be the ch children of that uh, bank and you will be earning and giving them. Interest. And the interest will Retaining be paying them. interest and will be, the capital will be like this only. Uh, you must have been surprised to hear that the loan they took 10 years back they are not able to repay you till today. And they have paid rupees 9 lakh as interest alone. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, that means still only 1 lakh of the principal amount has been uh, repaid. What if I have to interpret that? Uh, uh, as an economist or as a, this one, I would say if I raise loan and start integration, I would never be able to pay up the loan. Okay. I, rather, I would continue to do a, a, a job, job work, yeah. or slay for the, to pay the interest on the bank side and grow the chickens for the companies, and I remain like this. So in nutshell, what I say is, industry is positioned right now 
in a way that you know future looking mm-hmm. that means we are now i could say that you know taking a model as has been done in brazil as has been done in thailand as has been done in vietnam mm-hmm. so we are on a juncture now from a live market moving towards a process market so companies like tyson foods have been trying to export this model overseas actually for decades and in a real concerted way over the last decade Tyson is trying to expand in India and yet the the culture and economy in India is still very different from the United States. A lot more people still make their living from farming in India and they haven't been as successful I think in building these vertically integrated models there and and developing the kind of markets they need for that. The international market is an absolute horizon for growth for these firms and I think what they're really hoping is that as this middle class expands uh in in the developing world it'll create you know the fast food restaurants that will then create the demand that they'll be able to sort of piggyback on that and create this model there the companies are making more profit in every bit from chick from feed from medicine vaccines detergents and marketing that means instead of uh, half a dozen uh, you know stakeholders there is one stakeholder one company making all the profit and leaving a very, very little to the farmer right <laughs> i don't uh, find the situation is different in us you should be able to throw more light on that unfair contracts turn what could be a real economic opportunity for farmers all around the world into profits for a handful of corporations Some of the biggest US companies like Tyson Foods have global operations and some of the biggest international companies own large stakes in American companies like the Brazilian JBS which controls 75% of Pilgrim's Pride. By expanding in the global market, these companies can secure higher profits for their stockholders and ensure a better position for themselves. Worldwide, the role of the farmer is changing. Unfair contracts make it harder for independent farmers to keep what they've earned as they get less and less of the profit for the food they produce. These types of contracts are showing up everywhere, not just in chickens, but in other sectors of livestock production, in seed production, and all across agriculture. Under this model, independent farmers sign up to be their own boss. but they become more like employees for large corporations. To me farming means you have some control over your operation. The poultry grower today he's got to do it the way the integrators say do it or he don't get to do it. So he's not to me that's not farming. The poultry industry here I think has played a enormous part in Mississippi's economy. But there are some there are some bad deals in poultry. And uh you may not hear it from the from the side of 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 the economists in Mississippi. You'd have to hear it from the farmer. in Mississippi. Major companies, companies like Tyson, they got they got some pretty nice profit. At some point, some folks say it ought to trickle down. Why doesn't it? I think the biggest thing that's let us down is the government. They're the ones, they're the ones that 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 have really dropped the ball on this. Because once you get to that level, it's politicized. it it's a political issue uh it has nothing to do with what's right and what's wrong for the growers it has to do with how much money you going to give me for my reelection campaign my philosophy if not me then who if not now then when do i have personal losses absolutely i'd like to recoup my losses but more more so i'd like to see this industry change The Tyson family, I guess, has made somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion dollars in wealth in the last two or three years. And who paid the cost? 
biggest part of it. The growers and the employees. I confront them about that stuff. I don't care what they say. Yeah, and I've done that from day one. And I, I'm not bragging on myself. I'm just telling you, I think it's what every grower ought to do. I would tell the whole world, you eating fish, you eating chicken, you eating beef, pig, turkeys. I, I would tell the consumers, the farming industry done went to the, it done gone to the devil. Because I believe in having the food that we raise be accessible to the most amount of people possible and have that option where they are instead of just having one option. It's gonna take the village, it's gonna take the consumers, it's gonna take the farmers, it's gonna take the government, environmentalists, welfare activists, you name it. This is food, you know, it's just, it's, it affects us all. For the first time, with the support of consumers, more farmers are speaking out. Their stories are bringing to light fundamental flaws in the contract production model, just as workers in the plants are speaking out about unsafe conditions, and just as animal welfare advocates are holding companies accountable for animal cruelty. It's time for a change in the way we produce our food. Agriculture is becoming chickenized, as the same unfair terms in chicken contracts start to show up in hog, cattle, and strawberry production. But when farmers and consumers stand together, we can demand food that is produced fairly. We have a simple message for the companies that produce our food. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't cheat. The contracts that farmers sign with companies should be fair. We need a food system that is honest and transparent. Farmers need objective information about their businesses and consumers need the truth about how our food is produced. But most importantly, we need rules and regulations so that the industry referees, like the USDA and GYPSA, can enforce a fair playing field and farmers can hold companies accountable. If you're a farmer, thank you for the work you do. All of us can stand with farmers and advocate for a just food system. Thank you.